Before wheat conquered the world, there were other grains. Older, tougher, and built for survival. They didn't just feed people, they sustained empires. From Roman legions to medieval villages, they were the quiet foundation of life. But then, they vanished. Not because they failed, because they didn't fit the new rules. Now, as our food systems strain under climate pressure, soil collapse, and fragile supply chains, these forgotten grains are returning. Not as relics, but as solutions. In this video, we'll uncover how spelt and hulled barley fed Europe for centuries, and why the future might depend on remembering what they once knew. Before Wheat, the Forgotten King of European Grains Long before modern wheat filled every bakery, farm, and supermarket shelf, Europe was built on grains that were tougher and more dependable. Among them, spelt stood out, not as a luxury, but as a necessity. Spelt wasn't just another cereal. It was a survival crop. It fed Roman legions on the march, monks in remote abbeys, and peasants laboring from dawn to dusk. Across Central Europe, archaeological sites from Germany to the Balkans reveal granaries filled with spelt, sometimes carbonized and buried by fire, yet still intact. These weren't special reserves. They were the foundation of the diet. So why spelt? Because it worked when nothing else did. It grew in rocky soil, handled cold, and needed fewer inputs. Its tough outer husk protected it in the field and during storage, acting as a natural barrier against pests and spoilage. For communities living close to the edge, spelt wasn't just food, it was insurance. And yet it faded. Not because it lost value, but because industry chose speed. Modern wheat was easier to process in mechanical mills, faster to grow, and cleaner looking on store shelves. Spelt's protective husk became a liability. It required more labor, more time, and in the age of machinery that meant it no longer fit. But as industrial farming begins to show cracks from soil degradation to climate pressure, spelt is quietly reappearing. Not because it's trendy, but because it still does what it always did. Grow where others fail, store longer, feed deeply. Spelt, the poor man's wheat and the future's superfood. For centuries, spelt was known as the poor man's wheat. It lacked prestige. It wasn't served in royal banquets or milled into fine white flour. But that was precisely what made it powerful. It didn't need wealth or status to thrive. Spelt succeeded where more delicate grains failed. It grew in cold, wet climates and didn't demand rich soil. While others battled blight and rot, spelt stood firm thanks to that same outer husk that made it so hard to process. What once seemed inconvenient was actually its secret weapon. Its nutritional profile added another layer of value. Spelt was rich in protein, fiber, iron, zinc, and B vitamins, a full-spectrum fuel for people who labored daily and ate simply. In medieval Europe, it became a staple in dark breads, porridges, and rustic pastas, hearty foods that didn't just fill, but sustained. In some alpine villages, entire harvest festivals were dedicated to spelt. Local proverbs called it grain that never betrays the ground. For communities living by the rhythm of the seasons, this wasn't just food. It was a symbol of reliability. And yet, spelt disappeared not for lack of value, but because it didn't scale. Industrial milling couldn't handle the extra step of dehusking. Refined wheat offered volume, speed, and a cleaner product for mass markets, so spelt was pushed aside, but not forgotten. As people today seek food that's more nourishing, more sustainable, and more connected to the soil, spelt is re-emerging, not as a throwback, but as a strategy, a crop that asks for little and quietly gives more than we remembered. Grain taxes, control, and class. Why barley was power. Barley wasn't just food. In the Middle Ages, it was currency, leverage, and control. While peasants relied on it for survival, the ruling class saw something else. A tool to manage hunger, obedience, and order. Grain was heavily taxed. Lords demanded a portion of every harvest, sometimes up to a third, as payment for using the land or communal mills. 
these grain tithes weren't optional, miss a quota and you risked fines eviction, or worse. Barley became a form of negotiation and domination. It paid rent, settled debts, and secured access to ovens, tools, or grazing rights. Its ability to store well for long periods made it especially valuable during times of scarcity. A lord with a full granary wasn't just wealthy. He held power over who ate and who starved. In some regions, Barley's role went further. It was used to settle disputes, secure marriages, or pay soldiers. Its durability made it more than food. It became a stabilizing force and sometimes a spark for revolt. When uprisings like the English Peasants' Revolt of 1381 erupted, it wasn't just about high taxes. It was about grain. Who had it, who didn't, and who decided? The Medieval Grain Economy Why These Crops Were Replaced If spelt and barley were so effective, why did they disappear? The answer wasn't failure. It was efficiency, redefined. As Europe moved toward modernity, agriculture shifted from feeding villages to feeding markets. Cities grew, populations surged, and trade demanded volume, speed, and uniformity. Wheat fit the new model. It milled faster. It produced lighter bread. It looked clean, white, and modern on the table. Refined flour became a symbol of status, something soft, delicate, and removed from the soil. By contrast, spelt and hulled barley lagged behind. Harder to process, slower to grow, coarser on the tongue, and behind the scenes, land ownership was consolidating. Lords and later corporations prioritized cash crops. Fields that once grew diverse grains turned into monocultures, mainly wheat. Local seed varieties vanished, mill designs changed, and slowly the knowledge that had sustained people through centuries of crisis faded with the soil that once fed them. By the time spelt and barley disappeared from the mainstream, most people didn't even notice. Their absence wasn't dramatic. It was quiet, gradual. And by the time we looked up, our food system had become faster, but far more fragile. Ancient Grains and Ritual, Food Culture and Identity Spelt and barley weren't just sustenance. They were woven into rituals, beliefs, and cultural memory. In alpine villages, the first loaves of spelt each season were shaped into symbols and placed on altars. In marriage ceremonies, couples broke spelt bread together as a gesture of shared endurance. Some communities held blessing festivals just for the grain, thanking the land and praying for its return. Barley, too, had a place beyond the plate. It was used in small beer brewed for births, funerals, and harvest celebrations, linking nourishment to life's most sacred moments. Its reliability made it a grain of trust. In parts of Central Europe, Proverbs called it the friend of fire and frost. These rituals weren't just symbolic. They were part of a deeper rhythm between people and land, between what they grew, how they lived, and what they believed. And when the grains disappeared, so did the ceremonies. Now, as spelt and barley return, they're bringing more than calories. They're reviving stories and replanting forgotten roots of identity that once held entire communities together. Why we might need them again. Very soon. Today, we're not facing a single food crisis. We're facing many at once. Climate extremes are disrupting harvests. Soil degradation is accelerating. Water is scarce. And global supply chains, once taken for granted, have shown how fragile they truly are. In that reality, ancient grains like spelt and hold barley are no longer curiosities. They're fallback systems, quiet, resilient, and proven under pressure. Spelt can grow in marginal soil without fertilizers or pesticides. Barley survives with minimal water, stores for years, and nourishes deeply. These grains don't demand much from the land, but they give a lot in return. That's why regenerative farms in Scandinavia, Eastern Europe, and North America are bringing them back. Why some governments are adding them to food security plans, why bakers, brewers, and even Michelin star chefs are rediscovering their depth, texture, and value. What once fed peasants is now feeding solutions across fields, menus, and policy documents. Because when systems start to bend, it's not the most modern food that saves you. 
It's the one that's been saving people for centuries. Seed saving, how ancient grains survived in silence. If you've made it this far, you're already different because most people never stop to ask how the foods that built civilization survived long enough to return. The truth is, they almost didn't. Spelt barley, rye. These grains didn't endure because governments protected them. They survived because someone, somewhere, quietly refused to let them die. For centuries, seed saving was a personal act of resistance. A monk in a remote monastery who harvested spelt out of tradition. A farmer in the Carpathians who replanted barley because his grandfather did. A village baker who kept a jar of rye seeds wrapped in cloth just in case. These weren't researchers or activists. They were people who remembered. And because they remembered, the seeds did too. Even as industrial agriculture pushed for uniformity and speed, some families kept planting the old varieties. Not to sell, but to honor a rhythm that had worked for generations. They passed seeds like stories, from palm to palm, season to season. And now, those same seeds are being revived in regenerative farms, culinary schools, and even gene banks. It's easy to talk about food systems and climate resilience. Harder to imagine that the grains we need tomorrow were only saved because someone quietly believed they still mattered. So, if these grains ever feed millions again, it won't be thanks to algorithms or empires. It'll be thanks to a few hands and the simple decision to save what no one else saw value in. The monks who built their lives around spelt. Spelt wasn't just a survival crop. In some parts of medieval Europe, it became a way of life, especially behind monastery walls. In the Benedictine monasteries of Central Europe, particularly in what is now Germany and Switzerland, spelt was grown, harvested, milled, and baked as a sacred routine. These weren't vast commercial farms, they were enclosed communities that believed to work is to pray. And spelt was the crop that connected both. Monks planted it using simple tools and calendar rituals that followed the seasons and the saints. They saw spelt not only as food, but as a gift, something meant to be shared with pilgrims, the poor, and the sick. Its digestibility made it popular in medicinal diets prescribed by monastic healers. Some early herbal manuscripts even referred to spelt as the grain that brings balance to the body and soul. And because monasteries were among the few institutions that kept detailed written records, we now know just how central spelt was to their economy, their kitchens, and their charity. In a world where food was usually a matter of survival, monks turned spelt into something more a symbol of spiritual rhythm, self-reliance, and nourishment that went beyond the plate. Other Civilizations That Trusted Ancient Grains Ancient grains didn't just shape medieval Europe. They formed the backbone of survival in countless regions, with different names, techniques, and traditions, but with the same goal, reliability over refinement. In Eastern Europe, rye wasn't just common, it was cultural. From Poland to Russia and the Baltics, rye bread became a national staple. It wasn't fluffy or sweet. It was dense, sour, and sustaining. Villages in Siberia baked loaves that could last weeks, sometimes storing them in root cellars or hanging them from beams like meat. And just like in the West, the darker the bread, the lower your status. But the truth? That bread kept people alive through brutal winters and political upheaval. Meanwhile, in the Middle East and North Africa, barley held a different role. Though wheat was the grain of kings, barley was the grain of the worker. It appeared in thick soups in Morocco, flatbreads in the Levant, and was boiled with dates and spices into nourishing stews. In Islamic medical texts, barley water was recommended for cooling the body, treating inflammation, and restoring strength after illness. Even the Prophet Muhammad was said to favor barley bread over luxury grains. Across the world, barley, rye, and their forgotten cousins weren't status symbols. They were survival systems, quietly adapted to each climate, each soil, each struggle. Today, these regional traditions are resurfacing, restored by chefs, farmers, and historians who recognize that what once sustained whole civilizations 
might still have something to teach us. How These Grains Are Quietly Coming Back Today Across the world, ancient grains are no longer a fringe idea. They're becoming part of mainstream strategies for health, for climate resilience, and for local independence. In Denmark and southern Sweden, spelt is now grown by regenerative farms that supply Michelin-starred restaurants looking for richer textures and deeper flavors. Chefs are baking with long-fermented spelt flour to reduce gluten impact and bring back the kind of bread that fills you for hours instead of minutes. In Spain and southern France, hulled barley is being used in crop rotation cycles to restore depleted soil. Its deep roots break up hardened earth, while its biomass adds organic matter naturally, reducing the need for chemical fertilizers. Barley isn't just a food crop anymore, it's a soil repair tool. In Canada and Northern Europe, government seed banks have started reactivating ancient varieties, once thought lost. In some regions, farmers are being paid to cultivate them, not for mass sale, but for biodiversity conservation and food security trials. What was once peasant food is now seen as biological insurance. Even in cities, interest is growing. Sourdough bakers are turning to rye and spelt for fermentation depth and nutritional complexity. Athletes and endurance trainers are experimenting with ancient grain blends for sustained energy release. And in some urban schools, garden programs teach kids to plant spelt and barley, not just to grow food, but to grow memory. These grains aren't just coming back, they're already here. And while most of the world isn't watching, the seeds are being planted again. The Seeds We Left Behind Progress taught us to leave the past behind, but some of the answers we're looking for are buried in the soil we abandoned. Spelt and barley didn't disappear because they failed. They fed families through famine, war, and winter. They weren't perfect, they weren't fast, but they were enough. And maybe, enough is exactly what the future needs.